so welcome. How's everybody doing? You ready to hear some stories? Okay, so um, welcome to Green Building Alliance's Inspire Speaker Series. We're doing a storytelling session tonight, as you all know, about creating sustainable, vibrant, healthy, and just regions for all. Um, like most of you, I haven't heard these stories. Many of our storytellers rehearsed last night, but I wasn't here, so I'm anxiously awaiting <laughs> hearing everything that they have to say. Um, so before we get started, I have to go through and thank all of our partners. Um, so Green Building Alliance presents the Inspire Speaker Series in partnership uh, with P4 Pittsburgh and supported by the Heinz Endowments. Um, you'll, you should expect to hear more about P4 Pittsburgh um, in the next couple of months or so as more information about the measures, the metrics, and the implementation of the people, place, planet, and performance performance aspects um, of that process come out. Um, and GBA is representing um, all of your perspectives, um, along with others in this room, uh, at that table to make sure that we're creating great sustainable places uh, for us all. Um, I also wanted to thank uh, our series sponsors, uh, FedEx Ground and Fourth Economy are tremendously supportive of our work. Um, and Fourth Economy is um, convening the Inspire Community Network, which actually just met right before this uh, to talk about some crossover between sustainability and workforce, uh, which is some exciting outcomes coming out of our December uh, speaker series with Jeremy Rifkin. I also wanted to thank our partners and funders, um, Chatham University, Environmental Charter School, Forbo, the Heinz Endowments, the Laurel Foundation, the Hill House, Homewood Children's Village, Green and Healthy Schools Academy, the Schweitzer Fellows, Repair the World, Urban Innovation 21, and Sustainable Pittsburgh. And our media sponsors, WESA, WIEP, and Next Pittsburgh and a whole bunch of GBA sponsors uh, who support all of GBA's work throughout Western Pennsylvania. So, why are we here? We're here to hear some stories. And why do we tell stories? Because they're collaborative, right? They, they talk about a place um, and an action and a happening that we were all part of. They're playful, they're fun. We read stories to our kids. Right, my kids love stories. <laughs> they love to tell stories, they love to read stories, they love to draw their own stories. Um, you know, the stories resonate with us as people. When somebody tells a story instead of showing you a graph um, or reading a report, it resonates with you, it's what you remember. Um, and one of the reasons GBA has been telling stories up at a national level um, and telling, uh, listening to a lot of your stories for over 20 years is that we end up telling your stories to others to help them figure out what decisions they're making in creating more vibrant places for us all. Um, so stories become a really important part of every organization's work and sometimes telling stories is, is really hard. Um, so I want you all to remember as our storytellers come up on stage um, that this should be an interactive thing. It takes a lot of guts <laughs> to get up here and tell a story all on your own uh, in front of a room full of people. Um, so let's be playful. Um, but stories can also be subtle. You know, sometimes you listen to someone tell a story and you don't really know where they're going until the end, right? <laughs> sometimes I tell stories like that. <laughs> uh, but stories can be really subtle, but, but really hit you uh, at the end, and that's an important thing. Uh, stories are safe, right? They're part of our culture. They're part of our heritage and our history. You know, we remember stories. We tell folk tales and uh, all sorts of things, uh, fables. You know, we remember stories and they mean things to us. Um, and so that's what we're hopefully demonstrating on stage tonight. And stories are compelling, right? And especially if they involve children. Um, they're very compelling. They remind us of why we're doing what we're doing and how we're doing it. And Storytelling works, right? We hear it if you work for a nonprofit um, and other organizations, a big way to tell your story, to generate funding, um, is to tell personal stories, right? It's not just um, about an action or a program um, or a, a capital project. You know, it's about the story and how it happened and what that meant and what came out of that uh, and how things changed inside. Um, so we, there are a lot of reasons that we tell stories, but what makes a really good story? 
I know that we've all told bad stories. Um, <laughs> not in like a dirty bad stories way, but like <laughs> just a not so good story. You know, you start telling it and then you, you sort of forget why you're telling the story, right? You're like, well, why did I even start on this path? So, you know, there's an art to good storytelling, right? And I'm not telling a story tonight <laughs> for a reason. <laughs> Maybe I'm not the best storyteller, um, but what makes a good story? It's that personal connection, right? You can see yourself in my story and our storytellers tonight. You can resonate with how they felt, what they did, why they made that decision. Um, it's that personal connection that helps you um, remember their story. Um, but also something's at stake, right? Conflict, if you go back to your English class. <laughs> Conflict is good in the story. It sort of reminds you what's going on, why am I here, why am I invested in this story, you know? Um, I love this picture about climate change because I haven't heard Mark's story, but maybe, maybe there'll be a little bit of climate change in there. <laughs> so, you know, conflict is good in a story. Uh, it, it keeps you engaged, it keeps you active. Um, and then, you know, my father's an English professor, so the denouement bringing you to the end is, is a good part of any story. Um, leading us to good stories have a beginning, middle, and an end. These are things that we forget, right? You can go back to <laughs> English class in second grade and like write a story. Um, but sometimes as adults, we forget these basic principles, right? Um, God forbid we do like the tunnel funnel introduction to the story um, that we, some of us may have been taught in high school. Um, so on the stage though, in person, stories are about verbally showing. Not telling you I did this, but painting a picture, a verbal picture so you can feel like you're there. And so our storytellers tonight, we're giving them five minutes for a story. Um, and some of them have visual aids and some of them don't. Um, and none of those visual aids are typical PowerPoint slides. They're images because we want to evoke in you, you know, a, a resonance with this actual story they're telling. And since many of these stories are actually stories of place, we wanted to be able to show you some of the places uh, that these people are talking about. Um, so what else makes a good story action? Right, we all love action movies, things blowing up and things actually happening. You know, sometimes, you know, there are good stories that are slow and deliberate, but good stories like move you in a different way. And they move themselves, sometimes at different paces. Um, and so the ending is also key to any good story. Um, and so our storytellers didn't see these slides <laughs> before, before they developed their stories. So we'll leave it up to you, the audience, to encourage them um, and give them feedback about how well they're doing on telling their stories um, and being brave and standing up in, on stage uh, in front of all of you. Uh, because as J.K. Rowling laid out in Harry Potter, stories are only stories if somebody is willing to listen. And you are the listeners tonight for our wonderful, brave storytellers. And so I'd like us all to welcome our speakers tonight. This is the order that they'll be going in. So let's give them all an encouraging round of applause. Woo! And our first storyteller that I'd like you to welcome to the stage is the wonderful and illustrious Mark Dixon, um, famous locally for yurt and your environmental road trip, but also for his most recent trip to COP21 uh, in Paris, um, and uh, as GBA's videographer for the Inspire Speaker Series. So let's welcome Mark Dixon to the stage. It was 2 a.m. and I had two hours left before I needed to leave for my very first interview ever. And I had removed two screws from my $1,200 audio recorder, thinking I could fix it because it was broken that night. And two screws turned into 10 screws, turned into 50 screws all across the floor of an audio recorder that I had spent a significant chunk of change on and I barely even knew how to use, let alone knew if I could fix in time for this interview. And it wasn't just an ordinary interview, this was the first and it was with an important person, Lois Wolk, who happened to be a California State Assemblywoman. I thought this would be my, my big launch interview because it wasn't just 
Lois, it was actually the first interview on a project that ultimately became Yurt, which you referenced earlier. This was the test run, first interview of the test run of that road trip, the pre-road trip road trip, to see if I liked doing that to see if the universe was on my side in this endeavor for which I left my cushy job in Silicon Valley and started spending ungodly amounts of money so that I could help the planet find its way. This was not the sign that I was looking for from the universe. <laughs> it seemed like more the universe was telling me, be careful, you might get screwed. <laughs> but I persevered and I put all those screws back and lo and behold, that thing worked and has worked ever since. And, and then I proceeded on my trip, the pre-trip trip. This trip was scheduled to go up through Eugene, Oregon. I was going to interview a guy named Ian. And uh, Ian worked at uh, Sequential Biofuels. It's like a Whole Foods meets a Sunoco, solar panels on everything, Whole Foods in the, like Whole Foods food in the, in the gas station. It was amazing. Then I was going to go on up to Portland, and then I was going to go up through Bellingham and interview a guy named Atul, who, who runs his own biofuels company up there. And then I was going to turn around in Vancouver and then come all the way back down, turn that extraordinary video, I hoped, into a trailer, which would become the first trailer for the Yurt project ever. I look back on it and I cringe, but this was brand new, and I was ready to make it amazing, I hoped. So I rolled on up to Eugene. And I got out of the car and I found Ian and he toured me all around. And I ended up, I loved it. I really loved it. I, I got my B-roll right and I, I interviewed him and learned all about this gas station and got all these great shots. And then I knew once that interview ended though, I knew now came the hard part because I didn't feel like I was smart enough or funny enough to get people to watch my videos without having something extra, something special. And that special thing that I was gonna try to include was people on the street interviews. But I had never interviewed a person on the street, and I didn't think that I was good at it. I didn't know, but I was not excited about the prospect. I was excited about the prospect of people watching my videos, though. So these things clashed in me as I ran back to my car and sought refuge, trying to force myself back out of the car to go interview the Brex person who came out of that gas station. But I sat in my car for probably, I don't know, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten minutes. Minutes turned into more minutes, and I was probably there for 45 minutes doing that thing, you know, where you count down from 10 to zero, and you say at zero, you're just going to go off the diving board. I was doing that, but I did it over and over and over again without actually getting out of my car. <sighs> Finally, one of those 10 through zeros worked. Three, two, one. I stepped out of my car and just forced myself to walk to the door and then wait for the next person to come out. They did, friendly looking person, walked out, smiled at me and I said, I'm doing this road trip documentary project about the environment. Would you be willing to talk to me about environmental issues for a couple minutes on camera for my video project? And the guy said, sure. I actually, I know a couple things about this gas station. And I was like, oh yeah, really? Why is that? He said, well, I, I run a biofuels company. And I thought, oh, really? You run a biofuels company? That's cool. I, I, um, well, where are you from? And, and he said, well, I'm, I'm actually from Bellingham. And, and so I thought, I thought the same thing. It's like, what? You're from Bellingham but I couldn't remember his name. Like my, my head is like a spreadsheet, but the spreadsheet is on Google and it's not in my brain. And so I'm like, I think I'm gonna interview this guy. And so I just sheepishly said, I, am I going to interview you in a week? And sure enough, that was Atul Deshmane from Whole Energy from Bellingham who happened to be visiting Sequential Biofuels in Eugene one whole week before I was supposed to interview him. I had never met him. I had no idea that they were connected, but there I was, the first interview. After 45 minutes in the car, I must have seen five, six, seven, eight people come out of that gas station I could have interviewed, but because of my delay, boom. That was the sign from the universe <laughs> that I was looking for, and that Buoyed by that success, I, I traveled to Pittsburgh where my sister said, Mark, come live with me for free while you work on your film. I said, yes. I moved here, lived with my sister for free. And as the days approached the launch of the official big yurt, your environmental road trip, 
I got a call. We were just two days out from the, about two days out from that, from that launch party. I got a call from a Sierra Club member who said, we'd like to invite you to an upcoming event. It's the launch of this project called Yurt, Your Environmental Road Trip. I thought, that's so great. <laughs> that's my project. I'm so excited. Thank you for calling me about my project. Again, a sign from the universe. But this wasn't just any old sign from the universe. This was a, I was confronted directly by an act of community, a community engagement. It wasn't like a random serendipitous thing. It was like somebody sitting down and doing something that others consider to be potentially mundane. And it moved me almost to tears. I had to tell everybody, and then you all years later, that this person called me up to invite me to my own event. And so then I traveled all on the yurt trip, 50 states, one year, came back with all kinds of wisdom just packed into my brain. And, and then I've been working in the Pittsburgh community since then. But that Sierra Club incident, that wonderful boost from the universe has stuck with me since then. And I realized though, in reflecting over it, that maybe as we're pursuing those sustainable, just, vibrant communities that we all know and love, we want to see, maybe, just maybe, we could be moved by signs from the universe, sure. But I think we might move together faster and farther and together if we become the signs from the universe to each other. Thanks. That's a good story, Mark. Any words you want to give me about how you feel about Mark's story? Woo! Woo! Anything else? Ow. Ow. Man, I think Christian just wants me to say, repeat what he says. <laughs> Anything else? I think you nailed the ending, Mark. <laughs> awesome. Nice job. And maybe, maybe what Mark just did was gave you a sign. <laughs> that he's a great storyteller and that we're going to have a whole bunch of other people come and tell good stories with him. And, and so while our next speaker prepares mentally after that, I'd like to talk about places that you love and why. And somebody loves a small coal patch town where I spent summers with my grandmother. When I go there today, I see it through others' eyes. Rural, poor, disconnected, but it had everything I needed Love the outdoors time. Another place that you love, Allentown, because farm truck foods comes there. <laughs> and one more, Highland Park Reservoir. It's loaded with great memories of childhood, adolescence, of change, growth, personality, it is the place I miss most when I leave home. And speaking of home, we are in the home of Terry Baltimore. And so when you mention the Hill District to anyone, their mind goes to Terry Baltimore. She is officially the Director of Neighborhood Engagement at the Hill House Association, but she holds the history and the heritage of the Hill District in her heart, and she's here to share that with you today. Terry. Mark is going to be hard, a very hard act to follow. But one of the things that he said resonates with my story, and that is the universe trying to tell me something. A couple of years ago, I had a phone conversation with David Lewis, storyteller, architect, artist. And every once in a while, David and I connect. And at the end of this particular conversation, he said to me, I've got a new job for you. Great, another job. And he said, your job is to collect the stories. And the person you need to talk to is Troy West. Here's his email address, his phone number, his home address. I'm not sure if he's still alive, but you need to call Troy. <laughs> OK. So I hang up the phone, and I think, oh, sh <laughs> If Troy is alive, yay. But if he's not, 
then, oh my God, I'm the person that has to call David Lewis and say, I'm sorry to tell you this. So what I did was put Mr. West's information on the corner of my desk. A Couple of weeks later, I go to an event at the Carnegie Museum of Art, and they're talking about play spaces for children. The lights go down, slides come up, and this is the universe telling me to call Troy West. Because big as life, one of the slides said, Troy West. <laughs> All right. So I figured, well, if the universe put his name up, big as life, maybe it was my cue to call. I called Troy West, and he changed my life. I love the hill. Every day I tell stories about this place, and every day I learn something different. And Troy West opened a door for me that was so unexpected. He introduced to me the court of ideas. I had never heard about it. Asked people in the neighborhood, and people weren't really clear. They kind of remember it, but not really. And every day, for a period of weeks, I would get these emails of these incredible images of the court of ideas. So the court of ideas really started because young students from the architecture school at CMU and young people in the Hill called the Young Black Organizers were looking for a space of their own. It was the 60s and there was a lot of turmoil. So war and race and all of those things were percolating. And these were young people who were looking for an opportunity to have the conversation in a space of their own design. And what they did was absolutely incredible. They designed this space and then, without the permission of the property owner, constructed it. <laughs> so what's really cool is to hear Mr. West say, and Mr. Feinberg came back, and he was really shocked to see what was an empty lot had turned into this incredible space. It was a space that they wanted to create that provided opportunity for conversation. But then they also did some really cool things there as well. So they had snowball fights and holiday celebrations. Kids played on this space. They had music and art there. They had those difficult conversations there. But mostly they began to create a community. And that space to me is sacred. It only lasted a short period of time. And then as the neighborhood started to change, the buildings around this space kind of were knocked down on top of it. And what was really interesting was two years ago, we had Troy West come back. And what we did was an archeological dig to uncover the court of ideas. It was really interesting to not only talk about the court of ideas, but then we started to engage kids in this neighborhood in conversations about what kind of places they want to have and what kind of conversations they want to engage in in a space of their own design. So Mr. West went to a local elementary school and talked to fourth and fifth graders about the court of ideas and the kinds of things that they wanted to see there. So they wanted art and they wanted music. And one kid, who I'm sure all of his teachers loved, said, I want Wi-Fi so I can do my homework outside. <laughs> but one of the things that that conversation sparked was this idea that we can create a space again in this neighborhood for the 21st century difficult conversations that we need to have around race and sexism, police brutality, un unemployment. And so what's really interesting is this story has come full circle. Two weeks ago, an incredible group of design students from CMU have been, have been talking to people in the neighborhood about what we could do with the Court of Ideas. How incredible is that? That the universe would help, would have students from CMU and this, and this community create this space, and then 50, 60 years later, recreating it in a way that makes sense now. So what I hope you will see sometime in the spring are some really cool prototypes of the court of ideas and the ways that we can engage 
not just young people, but everybody in conversations that are incredibly important to Pittsburgh and the Hill District and to this country. So thank you very much. I love the court of ideas. <laughs> Woo! I love it. I wish we had a court of ideas in every neighborhood. And I'm excited to see that CME is bringing it back. It's great. Reactions? Yay. What? Build it. Build it, yeah. Woo. Anything else? Build it everywhere. <laughs> Build it everywhere, Andrew says. I like it. It's nice. What? We need a climbing court. We need a climbing court? Climate. Climate court. Oh, we need a climate court. Oh, we're going to make it topic specific now. <laughs> OK. So what is a place you love and why? Our first house, because we can get a puppy. <laughs> what is a place you love and why? My house. I used to hate it <laughs> because it was such a project. But now that we have brought it back to life and given it a second chance, I love it and cannot wait to see it at the end of the day. When you put heart into a place, it becomes part of you. I actually said today, I was giving Jenna a hard time because I wanted her to moderate today instead of me. And uh, she said she didn't want to be in the spotlight. And I said, it doesn't feel like being in the spotlight when I'm here, here at the Hill House because we're here all the time. It feels like our place now. And so thank you, Terry. <laughs> so what is the place you love and why? The sanctuary of East Liberty Presbyterian Church, because the music warms my soul. <laughs> Churches are amazing places, really amazing. Um, and so our next storyteller, pulling the thread from Terry and the Court of Ideas and Carnegie Mellon University, um, is Vivian Lofness. Um, Longtime professor at Carnegie Mellon University, internationally renowned uh, building performance, um, and GBA board member. Welcome to the stage. So I wish we had a campfire. Wouldn't that be perfect for storytelling? Um, how did I get here? Uh, well, it's a sort of a long story. Uh, like most of you in high school, I had no idea what I wanted to study. I loved math, I loved chemistry, I loved art, and so I went off to college and I studied chemistry and math and architecture, and I fell in love with architecture. And I realized as I fell in love with architecture that less than 1% of the practicing architects were women. I thought, uh-oh, this is not gonna be easy. So I took every math course, every engineering course, every technology course, thinking I better be on top of all the disciplines so that I could sit in a room of men and hold my own. And, and I did, in fact, sit in many, many rooms filled with men, and I'm sure they thought I was there to take notes until they realized that I wanted to actually contribute to the conversation. I did my bachelor's and my master's at MIT, and when you do your master's in architecture, you have to write a thesis. So I had made a decision with two amazing advisors, Ed Allen and uh, Kevin Lynch, to write a master's thesis on natural forces in the craft of building. I wanted to become a sight whisperer. That's like a horse whisperer, but it was someone who fell in love with sights, with the trees and the topography and the water uh, and the sun and the wind and the climate of that particular location. And I thought if we could actually let the sight whisper to us, our architecture would be brilliant. So I, I wrote this thesis and I was working feverishly on it. And when you do a master's thesis, even today, you have to defend it publicly in front of a large audience. But I was having trouble getting a time slot on the calendar of my advisors. And so I kept thinking, well, maybe if I do it at dinner time and I offer dinner, they'll come. And lo and behold, that was going to work. So I scheduled this, and my parents, who had come to my bachelor's graduation uh, at MIT, I had, uh, we had talked about coming again for my master's graduation, and thought, well, you know, it's pretty much the same place, the same ceremony. Why don't you come to my master's thesis presentation? Because that would be a defense, would be a whole different experience. So my parents said, sure, I can do this. We'll come up. So meanwhile, I told my mother that I was going to offer dinner in addition to my master's thesis being on the wall. So this was 150 pages of handwritten, hand-drawn, sight-whispering that I was putting up on the wall. 
And she kept saying, well, what are you serving for dinner? I said, look, I'm just trying to get the 150 pages written so I can put it up on the wall. I have no idea what I'm serving for dinner. And this would go on week after week. Every week when you talk to mom, she'd say, well, what are you going to serve them to eat? I said, I am really, I'm only about halfway through. I can't figure out what I'm serving to eat. So about a month before my final defense, we had this conversation all over again. And my mother said, look, this is getting ridiculous. You only have a month between now. Do you want me to serve dinner? And I said, oh, what a brilliant idea. Why didn't I think of this? And lo and behold, she had already planned the whole menu. She planned it two months before. She was going to make boeuf bourguignon and noodles and pate. And, you know, this is my mother was a gourmet chef. So this was a, a, a no brainer. So they, my father and mother drove up from Washington, D.C. in a long station wagon filled with pots of things to serve what I thought was going to be about 15 people, including, of course, my thesis advisors who had to approve this thesis. And she arrives in, in Boston. I lived in Harvard Square with uh, two roommates who were great. And they, we, uh, they were going to help my mother cook while I was still feverishly working on the last 10 pages or 15 pages of my thesis so I could get it up on the wall and actually pass uh, with, with a degree in architecture. And uh, my uh, roommate was working with my mother at home. I was feverishly working at the university. And the landlord comes upstairs to our apartment and knocks on the door. It's an Italian landlord who ran a structural engineering firm downstairs. And he, uh, he stands at the door with my roommate, and then he starts to say, well, uh, Sue, I just wanted to tell you your rent is not due till next week. And she goes, uh, yeah, I mean, we know we always pay the rent on time, and it's not next week, so why are you here? And he goes, well, I just, I just wanted to tell you that it's not due till next week. She says, I have no clue why you're here. She says, he says, you know, you girls have lived up here for a year, and I have never smelled anything this good come out of this apartment. What's happening here? And he says, oh, now I know why you came up to collect the rent. You just want to have some food. So, of course, he was the first taster of this meal, which then had to be trundled down from Harvard Square down to MIT and brought up three flights of stairs to this long, remote uh, corridor to where I was pinning up my 150 pages of my master's thesis. And the smells were so pervasive that we had over 60 people managed to find this thesis defense. Uh, it was a great success. I did graduate. And all I can say is that family matters hugely in the success of individuals uh, in, in any field, and certainly in architecture. So moving forward, I became totally fascinated with climate and microclimate. And I still, to this day, use this as the centerpiece of my teaching. For some people in this room, they know that. Um, I focused, when I was at the AIA Research Corporation, on climate and its impact on design, and was able to write a book called Regional Guidelines for Passive Energy Conserving Homes, where we talked about the brilliance of location of climates that are unique and different, uh, of being in the shade uh, and uh, looking at places that have brilliant sunlight, uh, places that have brilliant natural ventilation, and the difference between uh, airports like this and airports that are designed to embrace climate are massive, right? So there's no question in my mind that the beauty of place is about microclimate and, and region. Which brings me to the intelligent workplace. Now, I can't talk about Carnegie Mellon and the intelligent workplace without talking about Volker Hartkopf, who's sitting here in the front row, who many of you know, who brought me to Pittsburgh, and who's one of those very, very unique men who celebrate the success of his wife, and in fact, of every woman that he works with. So he's really a champion of women and women's success, which is really brilliant. And all of you women who are not married, I hope you find a husband like this. <laughs> So moving from site whisper to climate whisper to place whisper, the intelligent workplace, we get phone calls all the time from people who say, I'm calling from the stupid workplace. What's so special about the intelligent workplace? I said, well, the intelligent workplace has long views out over the campus where life moves around continuously. It has doors that open so you can hear the children playing down below. It has sunlight streaming in in the morning and sunlight streaming in the afternoon. It celebrates natural ventilation with windows that you can open, not worrying about whether the rain is going to come in. It's a brilliant place, and it's a wonderful place to live and work. And all I can say to those of you in the room who still work in the stupid workplace, I want to be your whisperer and see if I can help you get into an intelligent workplace. Thank you.
reactions. Who works in the stupid workplace? <laughs> <laughs> At least you're honest about it. What'd you say, Chris? Whisper to me. Whisper to me. Uh-oh, Volker, you better watch out. <laughs> <laughs> Vivian doesn't know this, but um, when I uh, defended my PhD thesis, uh, we did lunch, and my husband, who was trained as a chef, made lunch. <laughs> it was a packed room. <laughs> yeah, trailblazer, yeah. Vivian's definitely a trailblazer. Anyone else? Okay, what's well, a place that you guys love? The 7400 block of Tioga Street, because of the people. It's very specific, very specific. I love Pittsburgh because I grew up in the city and have a sentimental attachment to many spots I knew here when I was younger. And then also to new spots I only discovered later in life when I had expanded my range to larger circles in the city. I love nature. That means on my farm, walking in the woods, near water, it makes me feel active. This is the first one about nature <laughs> that I've had. <laughs> it, you know, a lot of times with GBA we think about the built environment and the vertical built environment. Um, I'm an engineer, so I know a lot about the horizontal infrastructure too that we all take for granted. But nature, you know, that's one of the reasons that we all do what we do. So I'd like to bring up our next speaker. Stephen Cooper, um, I love his title um, because he's not only the vice president of Winchester Thurston, he's also their outdoor education coordinator, school nurse, and PE department. <laughs> so <laughs> that says it all. Uh, he's also part of our Green and Healthy Schools Academy, so I welcome to the stage, Stephen. I've got less hair than that picture shows there. Um, so I have a confession to make. Although I am an elementary school teacher, um, growing up, I absolutely hated school. I despised it. Every second I was a prison every single day. Um, and the reason I tell you this is because my favorite moments in elementary school were recess and fire drills. Now, those were the only times that we were actually allowed to go outside for some reason at my school. And if you were to ask me at the time, you know, what do you like about the outdoors, you know, as an eight-year-old, I probably would have said, you know, because it's fun. And for those moments, I completely forget that I'm outside. Now, I do have to say it's not my school's fault. I know I was a very big knucklehead. Um, I could not sit still. I was, had trouble paying attention, trouble focusing. I didn't follow directions. Um, in my report card, it actually had the words ants in his pants. Um, so when I started at Winchester Thurston, um, I started working there. My very first day, I made sure that I declared I was not going to let any knuckleheads left behind. I was going to make their education so engaging and exciting and fun that they would forget that they were at school in a good way, not even realize that they were learning. Now, how do you do this? Well, I, my plan was to get them outside as much as humanly possible. So I went to the administration and I said, all right, this is my plan. We're going to be outside all day doing all of our lessons outside. And they asked why. And, you know, and the eight-year-old me was like, because it's fun, right? They didn't handle that real well, but what has to happen is I needed more information then. I needed to find out what were the benefits of having kids go outside. So I did a review of as many different case studies as I could find, and I have to say that I found overwhelming support that says that we need to get kids outside as much as possible. Thank you very much. That's my mother. Thank you. No, um, so... Um, so what I found was the more that the kids spend outside, the healthier they are, the happier they are, the more resilient they are, the better problem solvers they are, and also the smarter they are. Um, they show greater interest in the STEM subjects and they score higher on tests than kids that don't go outside. All right, so this is great and all. all right. So 
I go to my staff and I talk to all the administrators and I talk to the staff and we start getting kids outside every single day. And one of the, in the pocket of those studies that I found that really rates, relates to tonight and relates to some of my beliefs is that the more that we get kids outside, the stronger of an investment they have in their natural world and the greater their appreciation for their national world, natural world. Um, and as a follow-up to that, as adults, they become more advocates and they become stronger invested and they want to fight and protect what they love. So as adults, they end up becoming these advocates for this land. They've got greater interest in water quality, air quality, and wildlife management, and on and on and on. So I'm very excited to say that our students right now, we spend at least 90 minutes outside every single day, at a minimum, regardless of the time of year, regardless of the season. All right. And as a result of that, our kids are going to graduate, all right, becoming advocates, becoming civil-minded citizens, all right, who are going to be stewards for our natural world, and they're going to fight and protect for a just, vibrant, healthy, sustainable future. The planet is in good hands. Right? But what about my knuckleheads, right? What about the knucklehead kids that I swore when I started, I was not gonna leave any knuckleheads behind, right? I think of all those kids that are squirrely in classroom and I wanted to take, take them with me and have be part of this. So I think about our third graders, right? Third grade classes are filled with knuckleheads. <laughs> our third graders study the pioneers and at, at the end of their unit, they have a day of pioneering day, which they are all go outside and they spend outside all day long, living, working, playing, and even dressing up as the pioneers. They start with chores in the morning and they're building, we have a big campfire and they cook out on the fire and they're fixing fences and they actually study underneath the trees with these little chalkboard slates that they work on. Then at the end of the day, we all get together and as a community, we build a log cabin and it's an actual structural log cabin that I have to get a permit for from Hampton Township, but <laughs> just like the early Americans, right? Um, so they notch out the logs using the same building techniques and using the same tools that the pioneers you do. And that's the boys and the girls and everyone participates in this. Then we sit inside and we have a great wrap up session there. So this past year we had something significant happen to me is, um, after we build it, we climbed out of the woods and we head back to the school. And as we go into the classroom, we see all the buses line up at our school and parents are waiting. It's the end of the day and we're running a little late, so there's a lot of hustle and bustle. And I'm counting the heads and sure enough, we're missing one kid. <laughs> so I vowed I would not leave any knuckleheads behind and, and I realized who's missing the biggest knucklehead in the class. Um, so is this young girl who's wonderful, very nice, but is a knucklehead, right? So then I, I'll go get her. So I turn around and I race out of the school and I'm running up to the field. And as I'm running, I start getting mad. I'm like furious. You got parents waiting and buses are waiting and I'm running up and I know she's playing in that log cabin. We're running up there and I'm thinking, how could you be left behind? How could you not be focused? How can you not pay attention? Follow the directions. We all left at the same time. How could you not see that? And I'm getting angry. I go racing into the log cabin and it hits me. She's sitting there on the floor playing with the corn stalks, these two little corn stalks, and she's acting like they're two little pioneers. And she's making them talk, and, blah, 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 and she's singing. And I see the two little pioneers building a little log cabin out of sticks inside of the big log cabin that we just made. Uh, she looks up, thinks I'm really mad and gonna be screaming at her, which I was this close to. She looks up to me and she says, oh, Mr. Cooper, I'm so sorry. I was having so much fun, I completely forgot that we were at school. Thank you for your time. Thank you. So before I get your reaction, I have to read you this one. What is a place you love and why? Winchester Thurston North Hills Campus because of Steve Cooper. <laughs> so reactions. Nailed the ending? Yeah. 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 <laughs> Priceless. Yeah. So validation and encouragement and yeah, support. 
Okay, so what is a place you love and why? Redwood Regional Park in Oakland, California. Easy to get to, beautiful, and hours of hiking available. Cleveland Rock in McConnell's Mill State Park. A sacred rock that my two childhood best friends have been sitting on together for over 20 years. So the places that we return to over and over in our mind and physically. The Gap Bike Trail, because it makes my backyard 130 plus miles long. <laughs> Rivers and bullfrogs and hills and lots of smiling folks in our region. Lying under an old tree and looking up, new perspective and awareness, beauty, movement, light. With that, I'd like to introduce our fifth speaker, Muffy Mendoza, um, who is the founder of Pittsburgh Brown Mamas um, and also a GTEC ambassador. Um, she homeschools her three children and provides a support group for other, for a hundred other mothers, which I find pre pretty amazing. Um, and she's just dedicating her life to making sure that we're all good parents uh, to the people that are coming behind us. So, Muffy. chilly in here. I'm cold, so if I'm shaking, it's not because I'm nervous, it's because I'm cold <laughs> and my nose is running, so. I love, 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 love my home. The first time that I visited my home, or the house that I now call home, I was completely amazed by the mahogany wood walls. I loved the uniquely arched entryways that greeted me each time I walked into a room, and the subway tile in my bathrooms, which my dad has convinced me not to get rid of, I now love. It's so fresh and white when I walk into the bathroom and airy. I just love my home. I just love it. So it was no surprise that when me and my husband and our three children first moved into our house about three months later, we were like, all right, we're going to start painting to make this even more beautiful. It took us about 12 hours to paint one small living room because it was the first time that we'd ever painted together and it was the first time we had painted at all. So it took us a long, long time. We were up painting into the wee hours of the night. But I still wanted to get up early the next day because I wanted to see how my sons were going to react to the new paint job. I had chosen this dark fern green that I absolutely loved to go with my theme of trees for my house. So my middle son never gets up any later than 6 a.m every morning. It's without fail. That's what time he gets up. So he runs down the steps to play Xbox, because that's his thing, and he plops his little butt on the couch and surprised to see me, because I'm never up at 6 a.m. He usually wakes me up. So he looks over at me, and he looks at the room, and he says, you know what, Mom? This room is clean now. The first thought that ran through my head was that I was so offended. I'm like, what the hell you mean? I clean this room all the time. I am a stay-at-home mom. That's what I do. I clean. So it took a few weeks for me to, like, not be mad at him anymore. <laughs> it was just like, it really hurt my feelings. But I had to kind of translate in my head, okay, from a six-year-old perspective, what does he really mean when he says it's clean now? And I said to myself, oh, what he probably means is that now the room feels good. It feels like us. It feels like home. And so at that very moment that I kind of had this thought in my head where I assumed that's what he meant, I had an epiphany of my own. And I remembered my own childhood. Now, my mom, who is sitting here with us up in the balcony, was a very good mom. I mean, a phenomenal mom. My mom was a working mom who still made sure that we were loved, me and my other two sisters, that we were loved, cared for, fed, thriving. We all did well in life. And it's a testament. My life is a testament to her today. But what I can honestly say 
is that our home never really felt good. And I remember thinking to myself that this had to be normal because it didn't matter which one of my friend's houses I went to, the homes didn't really feel good. They didn't look like us. They more so looked like a section at Renner Center or a page out of a JCPenney catalog. They just didn't look like us. And so I thought to myself, fast forward years later, I'm an adult now, I have one son, and something happened to me that I never would have imagined would happen to me. And that was that I met a man who just wanted to take care of me. And he said to me, why don't you stay home and continue to take care of you and take care of our children? Now, as the daughter of a working mama, this was something that I was like, um, I don't know about that. That just may not work. I'm used to being independent. But then I thought back to my mom and my mom's friends who were basically the runners of America. Our mamas left the house at 7 a.m. They didn't get back home till 8 p.m. They were the fry cooks. They were the customer service reps. They were the uh, maids and nurses of the American nation. And while they were running America, nobody ever really loved them. But this man loved me. So I said, hey, I'll give it a try. Now, me and my husband have been married for coming up on nine years. I love it. And four years, we moved back to New York, back to Pittsburgh from New York City four years ago. And I've been able to do an, an unimaginable about, uh, amount of things with this extra time my husband has now given me. I've been able to, this just in the last four years, rehab a vacant lot. I have a garden of my own in addition to that. I've been able to start a support group for black moms. I've been the president of the PTA at my kid's school. Now, some of you may think that that's something any mom can do, but let me tell you, when you're working from 7 a.m. and not getting back home until 8 p.m., you ain't got time to paint all the walls or choose home decor or even join the PTA. You're lucky if you make it to a parent-teacher conference. So. Everybody's asking questions. Questions like, how do we end inner city violence? How do we uh, stop racism? How do we prevent or close the achievement gap? And I have some very easy answers. I mean, they are so, so, so easy. One thing we can do is pay a mom a just working wage, so that she has to work only from nine to five to provide a life for her children. Bottom line, overtime kills kids and communities. It almost killed me. We can give a black man a chance in America so that the same way that I was able to meet a loving, caring, kind, financially fit man who could provide for me a mom of 19, at 19 years old, out of wedlock, can be a good and loving and kind husband to another mom. The bottom line is if you want to see beauty where there's blight, if you want to see love where there's hate, if you want to make dads better dads so that kids can become better adults, let moms go home. That's it, thank you. I gotta go. <laughs> I gotta go home. <laughs> Reactions? Powerful. Yes, mama. Powerful, yes, mama. What? Give a black man a chance. Give a black man a chance, yeah. Go back in time. Go back in time. Slow down. It starts at home. It does start at home. It does, it's hard. Mamas run America. <laughs> Vote for the change. <laughs> Vote for the change. <laughs> okay, what is a place you love and why? My house. It's safe and I feel relaxed when I am there. It takes a lot to make a house a home. A lot. 
I love Pittsburgh because it is always evolving and full of people who support it through good and bad. I love my garden. It's a place I grow. It's a place I have roots. It's a place I come for nourishment. It's how I feed my family. It's where I learn from nature. It's where I come for love. And with that, I welcome to the stage Leia Lizarondo, who I recently made the deeper acquaintance with, um, known for the Brazen Kitchen. If you stopped her at Whole Foods to ask her what was in her cart, she does not appreciate that. <laughs> but amazing person, welcome Leia. So, um, so I was um, 13 years old, and I was standing in front of our fridge, and my mom had just put up this piece of paper with a list of foods that my dad couldn't eat. Um, he was just diagnosed with chronic kidney disease, and they had just come home from the doctor, and this was a list the doctor gave him. And I was looking at it, and I was reading it, and on the list was, Meat, beans, eggs, nuts, grains, bananas, milk, cheese, salt, squash, broccoli, carrots, potatoes, and other root vegetables, tomatoes, spinach, okra, beets, artichokes, nuts and seeds, avocados, bananas, dried fruits, papaya, pomegranate, oranges, mangoes, nectarines, honeydew, kiwi, cantaloupe, apricots, and even chocolate. I looked at the list and I thought, what could he eat? And I thought of my dad. My dad, my dad loved food. My dad um, brought us to fancy restaurants every week. My dad, um, when his idea of taking me out for a happy meal at five years old was eating sushi before it was normal or cool. And his best present to me was this encyclopedia of world cuisine. And I thought, could there be a worse disease that my dad could have? And so absent of you know, any other guidance, you know, my mom was just feeling helpless and hopeless. And so we just continued to eat the way we usually do. And you know, because it seemed like my dad couldn't eat anything and my mom was just, just, just given up, basically. And so, you know, we would eat meals together, and I would look at my dad, and I would think, he can't eat that. He's killing himself. And I was frustrated. So I went to the, to the bookstore, and I looked at all the cookbooks, and this was the Philippines 20 years ago. There was no paleo or special diet cookbooks. There was just one special diet cookbook, and it was, it was this book. It was the most an inspired, bland cookbook I could find in the bookstore. And it's a diabetic cookbook. It's 200 delicious recipes for a low fat, low sugar, low cholesterol, low salt diet. Yum. <laughs> and I was 13 and I read through the whole thing and I followed each recipe to the letter. And they were horrible. <laughs> and I remember this one in particular the moment my dad and I were eating it. Um, it was baked fish with mustard sauce, and the ingredients included um, margarine, and instant non-fat dry milk. And my dad would eat the food that I would cook, and I would eat it with him in solidarity, you know, against this, this lifeless food. But I knew he wasn't happy. And you know, after a while, you know, it, that kind of faded away and he went back to eating what he wanted to eat. And um, he, fi he finally passed away from kidney disease and, and while food was not a smoking gun, I, you know, I always thought to myself, maybe if I was better at cooking healthy food, I could have saved my dad. And um, so, you know, I forgot about all that, and, and, but in my 20s I got very, very ill. 
and my body was racked with this pain that the doctors couldn't understand. And so they gave me pills for the symptoms, and the pills caused other symptoms that they gave me pills for, so those pills caused other symptoms, and then it was just pills and pills for days with no end in sight. Until one day I said, you know, this is not gonna work. So I started researching, on the internet, which was new then. Um, and I read all these crazy things, these crazy things I kept on reading, crazy things that said that, you know, when we eat healthy food, we actually get healthy. And so I said, wow. And then I thought about my dad and that stupid list on the fridge. And I said, all right, I'm going to teach myself how to cook healthy food and change my own health. And I learned how to cook because I didn't want to feel sorry for myself with every meal and I certainly did not want to cook from this cookbook. Um, and so I started to eat vegetables and fruits and the things that were told to eat and I started feeling better. And then I started losing the pills because the symptoms weren't there anymore. And then I started feeling the best I've ever felt my entire life. And then I remembered my dad and I thought of him, and I thought of all of us, you know, cancer, diabetes, heart disease. If food could change the quality of our lives, why are we not saving ourselves? And then I remember, and I realized that, you know, doctors get less than 20 hours of nutrition education over four years. But even more importantly, advertisers spend billions of dollars telling us that we don't have time to cook, that if we labor in the kitchen, we're being too hard on ourselves, that you shouldn't spend money on vegetables because for a dollar, you could get a burger, french fries, and a big vat of soda. You know, how can, how can carrots stand up to that? You have to peel them and chop them and cook them, jeez. You know, it, and then, you know, there's pills for the pain and the gas. <laughs> and then it clicked. And then I became this crazy person who talks about vegetables all the time. You know, I called myself a veg hacker. And then I started writing about vegetables and so much so, and talking about vegetables so much so that as Aurora said, you know, when I would run into people at the grocery store, they would hide their cart. <laughs> And now I find myself, you know, you know, feel like a Robin Hood of sorts. You know, I've started a movement of people that rescue fruits and vegetables, really good food from going to the dumpster and redirecting it to those who need it the most because everyone deserves to be healthy. And after years of therapy, you know, I realized that, you know, maybe I do what I do because I try to do for everyone else what I failed to do for my dad. Whew, reactions. I'm hungry. Hungry. Functional medicine forum in Pittsburgh, February 29th. <laughs> February 29th, functional medicine forum in Pittsburgh. I love it. Carrots, you have to clean them, you have to chop them, you have to cook them. <sighs> Who has time? <laughs> it's important though. We have to eat healthy to be healthy. So we're six storytellers down. Let's give them all a round of applause. <laughs> Woo! It takes a lot of bravery to come up here and bury your soul. It takes a lot of bravery to come up here and not introduce yourself, which is what I did. <laughs> I'm Aurora Sherrard. I'm the executive director of Green Building Alliance, <laughs> in case you don't know me. Um, so what is a place you love and why? My studio, because that's where my mind is free. Bronzeville in Chicago and U Street in Northwest DC. Why? Culture. Culture. I drove through Squirrel Hill earlier this week. Chinese lanterns are up to celebrate Chinese New Year. That's the first time I've ever noticed them for 12 years living in Pittsburgh. It was a good thing to see. 
What is a place you love and why? The Carnegie Art Museum. History, nature, imagination. Merge in a beautiful and proud place. 3D, 2D works. Every work and artist has a story. It's true. So with that, I'd like to welcome to the stage Mr. Robert Foffman, who knows that every place, every building has a story and has great respect for that. Thank you. I turned 60 a couple weeks ago. <laughs> My sisters are still mad at me because I don't have any gray hair yet. Um, when you turn 60, I, um, we've been going through a lot of parent care issues, and one of the things that we notice um, is that as you get older, your long-term memories, your early memories become more vivid, and your short-term memory shrinks. <laughs> Where am I? <laughs> um, and so my earliest memory was uh, in a window in my grandmother's house. We lived, had an extended family, and we lived with my grandmother. Father was going to school at Northeastern in Boston. And um, I would always look out this window and see this radio beacon flashing in the distance and the stars, and this is the Sputnik era, and I really wanted to be an astronaut. <laughs> but I was always framed within that window. That window is something I fixated on as my earliest memory. And uh, so there's a whole series of windows uh, in, in these stories, uh, stories in these windows. And um, so my grandmother um, was, uh, her husband died when she was uh, young, and she had to become an entrepreneur. She was an interior designer. And I helped her decorate windows, put in uh, cornices and um, window dressings, all kinds of things. She did mostly colonial homes in New England, so I traveled around with her and learned uh, about the architectural styles of the New England homes. And um, then fast forward to, um, and, and she was a classic New Englander, um, a great storyteller, unlike me, and uh, very gruff, and, uh, and at the same time, um, very passionate about what she did. We called her, she had the gift of gab. <laughs> um, and uh, so when fast forward, I decided to go to Syracuse University in architecture, and uh, this was in the first energy crisis in 1974. And uh, so I was immediately immersed in the first attempt in architecture schools to begin to deal with sustainability. And um, I ended up um, meeting the director of the facilities planning department at Syracuse University. I ended up working work study and then full time um, at the university. And my first job was to inspect windows and dormitories. <laughs> <laughs> Not an exciting job, but then I start to connect these things together. Um, and also at the same time, a classmate of mine a couple years ahead had this newfangled Apple II computer. And um, he said, I'm the energy coordinator for the university. And I'm like, what is that? <laughs> and my boss was very interested in historic preservation. And she was restoring a house. Her name was Ginny. And Ginny smoked cigars. She drove a ru rusty Jeep. And she was restoring a cobblestone house out in Fayetteville, New York, outside of Syracuse. And so I would go out with her to her house to watch her make horsehair plaster and cut nails. I mean, she was into it, seriously. And so we'd come back to the university, and she knew every inch of the university. And so that's where a lot of my preservation ethic started. And the, the sort of culmination or the merger of um, interest in history and, and that passion for place merged with the question of sustainability was we also did an energy model for a the unit school of architecture um, it wasn't for the school of architecture there was no researchers it was just the facilities folk that got a grant to weather strip windows and so we took that apple II and we calculated and came back very proudly and said there's a five foot hole in the side of slocum hall the school of architecture because we calculated all the little cracks around all the windows and figured out that if we weather stripped the windows, we could save a lot of energy. And um, so that really carried through through all my whole career, these little incidents around windows. And then um, I left Syracuse um, and came to Pittsburgh. My wife is from Pittsburgh. And uh, I had the good fortune to connect uh, with Peter Bowen and then to Carnegie Mellon, with people like Volker and Vivian. 
and got an opportunity to learn about what they were doing and had the unique opportunity to work on the intelligent workplace. Um, had a huge ripple effect on my career and I got to follow Volker around Germany at 100 miles an hour in a Volkswagen, you probably don't remember this, <laughs> in the middle of the night. <laughs> I had never... <laughs> <laughs> and I got to go to the labs at, at uh, the research facilities um, for the curtain wall company that I'm sorry I've forgotten. Gartner, thank you. And we got to help the lab coded engineers design a new window. And in this case, this is called the water million, right, Booker? And so the idea of integrating heating and cooling into the envelope of the building, I kind of love that picture because it looks like a human being, right, <laughs> with a head. And um, so the, um, the, the, the story is also, I think, tied to sort of both the left brain and the right brain side of, of looking at design from um, the intuitive side as well as the rational side. You need the science and the engineering, but you also need um, the art of, of design. And so that, that really has had an influence on me um, throughout my career. Maybe the next slide I can look at here. Um, my passion for preservation and this interest in building performance uh, in a small architectural practice where there's limited means uh, sort of connected me to a couple of really important places in Pittsburgh. One is Rachel Carson's homestead. How many of you have been to the homestead? Great. Um, I had an opportunity to um, help uh, get a grant and uh, restore the windows in the house. And the first time I went into the house and went upstairs to her bedroom and looked out that window, I knew I had found Rachel Carson, so it's pretty cool. And that picture is n nothing like what she probably saw. It was probably much darker and grayer. There probably weren't leaves on the trees. Um, but she was also looking at the beautiful orchard around her and the, the wisdom of nature around her. But I've always enjoyed um, that window, uh, and it means a lot to me in my practice in thinking about that. Um, so the, um, we keep coming back to these windows. Um, the next house is August Wilson's house just down the street here. And I got involved in that. Um, actually, Terry Baltimore was very helpful. Um, we designed the Hill Library. And uh, is Afton here? Do I see Afton? Yeah. <laughs> Afton was involved in that. And we um, really started to immerse ourselves. I think one of the things that um, is great about being an architect is you get to get into other people's business. You get to. <laughs> other people's cultures, other people's places, and so you really get to explore and, and, and develop a little diversity of interests. And working on the Hill Library, we learned about August Wilson, and I man, man, ran into Christopher Rawson, uh, a PG Post-Gazette critic that has worked with Larry Glasgow on the uh, history of August Wilson and the Hill. And that led me, uh, after the um, Hill Library, to help with an historic structures report for August Wilson's house. And this is an ongoing project right now. And what's so cool, that's the set for seven guitars on the right. And on the left is the rear of the house. How am I doing on time? <laughs> and so this is an ongoing project. I was just over there today. We're hoping to actually have seven guitars performed at the site this summer in August. And so the last slide is probably closer to what some may know about me as an advocate for historic preservation. You notice I haven't mentioned the Civic Arena yet? <laughs> There's, I'm going to mention it. <laughs> so this is my office window. And the view on the right is uh, Market Square, and that's the view I used to have. And the view on the left is the window that used to show that view. And those are the windows of our building, the Benedum Trees building. And I'm a 13th owner of that building, which is cool. Um, but we, um, as a condo association, we had a challenge that a great new green building was going up next to us. And it was taking one hole five feet away from us. And so I guess what I'm tying all these windows together is that we need to think about windows not in terms only of their energy performance and their cultural importance, but also how they connect to the health of our lives inside buildings. And that this needs to be part of uh, the way we think about green building. And so that building I'm hoping was inspiring to go forward. Um, it's on Fourth Avenue, so we've created an organization called Go Forth. And the idea is to begin to bring all the new residents that are now living there 
and all the small businesses uh, together to advocate for uh, quality of life on that street, its historic presence, and uh, to make the history known of that place. So the, the, I, the thing I will leave you with the idea that we all hear about eyes being um, you know, part of your, you know, the eyes of the soul, the, the connection to your soul, and I think windows are the connection to the soul of a building. Thank you. Reactions? Are stories a window into our souls? A little bit. Rob Hoffman's soul is built on buildings. <laughs> Any feedback for Rob? Nothing. Nobody wants to share. Oh, you were a good storyteller. There you go. You got some validation. <laughs> so what is a place you love and why? My workshop. I say something now that I thought about it. <laughs> <laughs> one word, Volker. I just one. For those of you who didn't hear that, we should be supporting what new buildings can be and what old buildings can be and what they can be together. Right. Sort of my interpretation. Um, <laughs> so what is a place you love? My workshop, because I can be creative and solve problems. I love the Melwood Road from Polish Hill to Oakland because it's like a wormhole from one community to another. I love Pittsburgh's convoluted topography and pathways. I remember when I was new to Pittsburgh and you know you have, this is before Garmin's really, you know the map, you're trying to get places and you're like okay I'm gonna get there from here and you're like where's this road? Oh. <laughs> And leading into our next storyteller, what's a place you love and why? Carnegie Library in Oakland, because it's always filled with people excited to learn, teach, read, and share. It has a great sense of community. And so our next speaker is Tess Wilson. She's a Pittsburgh Schweitzer Fellow, which is an amazing program and one of our convening uh, partners for the Inspire Speaker Series. But Tess is from Kansas. My parents live in Nebraska, so there's something about living in the middle of the country that gives you a lot of time to think. <laughs> Sometimes too much time to think. Um, and maybe that's why she moved to Pittsburgh to pursue an MFA in creative writing. So I have high hopes for this story because she's a creative thinker. Um, <laughs> I hope. Um, and, and the connection to the library is she's just been accepted to the Library Science Master's program at Pitt. So welcome to the stage, Tess Wilson. So working 43 hour weeks and really needing the food stamps I'm eligible for was not really part of the plan when I graduated from college. The plan was to pursue the career of the professors that I had admired so much, my poetry professors. I was going to get an MFA in creative writing, and then I was going to come back to Kansas and teach alongside the professors that I liked so much, buy a whole bunch of cardigans, go into the office every day, smell old books, grade new papers. It sounded like a pretty awesome life to me. And so I stuck with that plan for a while. I applied to a lot of MFA programs. I got into the MFA program at Chatham, and so I came to Pittsburgh. And during my time at Chatham, I was able to work in two different, very different classrooms. One was an all-girl undergraduate intro to creative writing class. And the other was an all-male writing class at the Allegheny County Jail. Those are very different spaces. <laughs> uh, but Similar things happened in both arenas. When I would introduce a new poem or a new piece of fiction or nonfiction to my students, they had two moments. One moment was, I can read this. I can relate to this. And the second moment was, I could write this. I could be the person who tells this story. And it was those moments that convinced me I was still on the right path. So I kept with the path. I stayed in the program and continued my work towards being an English professor. 
And then I heard of the Schweitzer program. And the Schweitzer program funds graduate students to design and operate and implement their own program to, uh, in an underserved community that they think they could serve well. And my program was a writing workshop for young women in the Braddock, East Liberty, Wilkinsburg, and Millvale communities. I worked through the libraries. And every week, we would read poems, pieces of nonfiction, fiction, and we would write. Sometimes we would do those things, but mostly we would just talk and hang out, and I would see what they needed to talk about, what they felt like they could talk to me about. And it was through these programs that I met a girl named Tijuana in Braddock, in the Braddock Library. And one day, we were doing a writing exercise that doesn't really have a formal name, but it explores identity through word banks. So the way it works is, you guys should try this too, it's a really fun exercise. So you pick 10 verbs, 10 adjectives, and 10 nouns that you think describes you. That you think describes you. And then you pick the top 10 of those words that you think describe you best. And then you put those words in a list. And we named ours I am. And Tijuana nailed it. Hers, I think it's on one, another slide. But hers, I am the best babysitter in the world. I am a wardrobe. I am pop rocks. She was incredible. And she had that I can write this moment. And that was what did it. I dropped the thread that I was on. I, I finished my MFA program because my mom taught me to finish everything to start. But I finished the MFA program and then pretty much left that avenue of my life. I joined AmeriCorps, which is the 43 hours of work and eligible for food stamps. Joined AmeriCorps and worked work with Reading is Fundamental. And we go into schools, they align pretty perfectly with, with what I believe in. We go into schools, we introduce kids to the power of words, we introduce them to creating home libraries. Um, and the plan is to pursue my master's in library science after this. And I think the reason I did all that, I changed my path, was because I didn't want to wait to have the I can write this, I can read this moment with those kids until I had them in a college classroom or jail. That's my story. Thank you. <laughs> Reactions. Inspiration. Inspiration. Reality. Reality. I am. Yeah. What is a place you love and why? Millvale, for its scrappiness and willingness to reinvent itself. Millvale Library. It reminds me of what is possible and what people can accomplish together. And with that, I don't need to tell you any more about Lisa Seal, except that she's with the Millvale Community Library. <laughs> Thank you. Well, my story begins in 2009, in May of 2009. Um, my husband's law firm was involved in a day of giving activity, and we were sent to Millville, which I was familiar with because I had gone to Shaler High School and lived in Shaler all my life. So I was familiar with Millville. We went and we were brought to an empty lot where my daughter and I planted over 400 sunflowers and my son and my husband fixed a fence. And this lot was, um, it had been destroyed by the floods that, that plagued Millville, but also um, the building that was there had burned down. So there were a lot of heavy metals into the soil and a lot of problems, a lot of contaminants. So they were trying to reclaim that soil because they wanted to put a garden in. So at the end of the day, I'm tired, I'm hot, I'm very sweaty, gross covered in dirt, and one of the girls I had been talking to all day came up to me and said, you've got to meet somebody. And um, I was thinking, well, boy, I'm in a great condition to meet somebody right now, so why not? Um, 
So I went, I followed her down around the block, and we went into a building that looked like it had been condemned. Um, it was also destroyed by flood waters, and it was vacant. It had been vacant since 2004 when um, Hurricane Ivan had swept through, and it sent poor Rudy, the TV repairman that owned the building, into retirement. So. Um, we, we get to the building and we go inside and there are wires hanging and mud and dirt and it's just a mess. But sitting near the window on a five gallon bucket that was overturned with a laptop is this man. And this man has this mass of gray hair curls that are just everywhere and he says, Welcome to the Millville Library. <laughs> and I looked around and I said, I have just been introduced to the town lunatic. <laughs> and he's in, the, he's in the audience. <laughs> well, what I found out through that experience is that I had been, I had been introduced to some crazy, crazy stuff that was going on. Um, and anyone that knows me knows that the next logical step for me was to jump on that crazy train and ride it all the way. So we set out, um, I, I talked to Brian, and he's telling me about his vision for this building is to be a public library. Millville had never had a public library before, so this was an inspiring story. He wanted to have a library, um, he and a group of friends had decided that this was a good idea and they were going to build it. Well, looking around at the surroundings, I thought, okay, whatever. And um, he went into his vision. And his vision was for a community space where people could learn, people could um, discover community, discover each other, and really, really embody um, that, that feeling of community. The other thing is that it had to be self-sustainable because there was very little money um, and it was all based on grant writing, et cetera. Um, we had to be self-sustainable. That meant looking into solar power. That meant into using the buildings that were beside us that were also owned by, by the group, um, apartments upstairs, all of these things to generate income that would help support the library, help support programming, etc. So, like I said, I joined the crazy train, wrote it to, let's take it to 2013. In 2013, we opened the Millville Community Library. Um, it took persistence, it took guts, it took blood, sweat, tears, you name it, um, took sacrifice, and on weekends we would go and we would hammer removing walls, building walls, on the weekend, weekdays we would work to write grants, to, um, try to really, really plan for how we were going to run this library. None of us had any library experience. So take that train a little bit further to 2016, where we are now. Millville Community Library has now been opened for three years. And I could stand here and I could tell you about the 54 solar panels that we have on the roof of the main library building that produce enough electricity that we don't have to pay Duquesne Light a cent. And in fact, at the end of every month, Duquesne Light sends us a check. I could tell you about, thank you. I could tell you about the rain barrels and the cistern that we have that collects all of the rainwater from our roofs filters it down through the yard into a rain garden to help prevent runoff problems and flooding that have plagued the area for so long. I could tell you about our programs or our 700 
pay, new patrons or our 8,000 volumes that we have on our shelves. But the purpose of my story today is not to tell you about those things. The purpose of the story today is tell you about what I learned in the process. The things that I have learned during the past seven years are invaluable. I have learned that you can do just about anything when you put your mind to it. That if you are willing to give up some time, some guts, like I said, blood, sweat, tears, you name it, you can accomplish things that you never thought were possible. Here was a crazy idea a crazy idea to build a library from people who had no idea other than, hey, we like libraries. Um, here was this crazy idea, but we accomplished it. And I think that persistence and stick to it attitude that we've all had throughout this, and it's definitely been a team effort, um, has, has, is what led me to realize that what I really learned from all of this is that although our library's motto is more than a library, an agent for positive change, I became more than a person. I became an agent for positive change. Thank you. Who feels like they're an agent for positive change? Yeah? Reactions? Okay. That was awesome. Don't ask, just do, yeah? Just do it. I'm looking for a crazy train. You're looking for a crazy train. Follow Chris, your follow your dreams. Chris is going to jump on your crazy train. My was <laughs> You're wearing a hat, Brian. You're wearing a hat. I'm just saying. I said in 09. <laughs> in 09. Okay. It's been some time. Okay. You said me a couple gray hairs. <laughs> Hair dye does wonders. Um, my library, because everybody is happy to be there and it's free. What's a place you love? Brookline Boulevard. It has a walkable main street, local businesses, and I get to know my neighbors. This is one of mine, but I didn't write it. Flagstaff Hill, because it's so sunny and you never know what group might be assembling there. Ontario, because I was born there and it's beautiful. So I'd like to bring up our last storyteller, Christian Hughes, who's with Kingsley Association, Drafting Dreams, a former GBA intern, all around amazing guy, and is wearing a button. He just took off his jacket that says, do it with an architect. <laughs> Good evening. So this is a humbling experience for myself. Um, as a former GBA intern, I used to love this event. So to be able to speak is very humbling and to see a lot of people that are responsible for my success here is very humbling as well, so thank you. First, I wanted to shout out a group of my neighbors. Well, they're not, we're not neighbors yet, but the Lauren Rico Housing Group, hey. So even though we're not physical neighbors yet, we are already neighbors, and they are out here in large numbers, so I had to shout them out. Now I'm going to put this jacket back on with this button, <laughs> because it's cold in here. And I'm from Detroit, so if I say it's cold, it's cold. You want me to turn, turn around? Oh, you're taking a picture. You're, you're lucky you're Aunt Viv's husband. Okay. So obviously I'm going to take all seven minutes. <laughs> all right, so now for the storytelling. I'm not from here. I'm from Detroit. Graduated from high school in 2009 and went down to Hampton, Virginia to pursue the Master of Architecture degree from Hampton University. Um, Hampton University is a historically black college and university, which I graduated from there at Mother's Day of 2014. 
But let's talk about that experience. So in January of 2011, um, that was when I first realized that I had to be self-sufficient. My mother had just lost her job in 2010, and I was having issues getting back into school, you know, dealing with the financial clearance line and the threat of having to pack it up and go home. But the fact that the money wasn't there, it did not stop me because you couldn't tell me anything. I was in classes and wasn't on the roll, and I didn't care because I was not gonna let finances stop me from getting this degree. I'd wanted to be an architect since I was six. At this time, 2011, when I was 20, you, nothing was gonna stop me or so I thought. Um, but you know, it had just been by the grace of the people in the business administration that I had seen, I you know, just interacted with them over my years at Hampton and had been genuinely nice to. You know, Hampton uh, attracts a lot of affluent African-American children and you know, affluent children of all races get very snooty and snobby. And I'm not affluent in the least bit. So I'm speaking to the custodian the same way I'm speaking to a CEO. And it had been just by my good graces that those people had remembered me in my hard time. And the provost herself gave me enough time to get my finances together to complete my education. And I would also receive funds from my church and from the Department of Engineering, completely circumvented the scholarship program, the scholarship application, all of the process because I needed the money. So got back into school. In my mind, I was already back in school, so it didn't matter. <laughs> Moving forward, here comes fall of 2011. There was a curricular requirement for us to study abroad and go to France, travel to south of France. It was nice. And, but of course, you know, hey, Mother's still unemployed, and this trip cost $2,700. So I sent out 100 letters asking for $50, and then I got the trip paid for. This was before GoFundMe, Kiva, any of that. Like, I know how to raise some money if I need to raise some money. But back to the point of self-sufficiency, I realized that my mother couldn't do it like she used to. Uh, I came up in a single parent home, myself and my brother, but I was fortunate. My brother and I had a lot of things that some of my friends that had two parents did not have because my mother was college, is college educated. She's a chemical metallurgist. But at that moment when she lost her job, it was like, man, I've got to do this myself. So that instilled within me a self-sufficiency that was able to, um, I guess, get me to where I'm at now. So then we continue, you know, all of these things are happening. I'm like, yes, I'm almost an architect. Yes, I'm almost about to graduate. April of 2012 comes right before we leave for France. And I didn't want to be an architect anymore. <laughs> I'm 20. I wanted to be an architect for 14 years. And you know why? Now, it wasn't the money. Because the money clearly could have kept me out. It wasn't the money. It wasn't anything. I could not get my project printed on those big 24 by 36 boards because there was somebody on the plotter printing his project at the highest of quality on the best of papers with the best of ink. It took three days. I was ready to print on a Wednesday. It took three days for him to print his project. So I had to print my project on the eight and a half by 11. I just went up to my professor, turned it in and said, there it is, walked away. That was the end of that. I called my mother. I said, I'm not gonna be an architect. I don't wanna be an architect because if my progress is gonna be inhibited by, I can't, by not being able to print all of these papers and I don't wanna do it. All these trivial things are gonna get in my way. I don't wanna do it. My mother just, okay, mm -hmm, okay. So I talked to my professor about that, and my professor said, oh, just relax, we're gonna to go to France, and you're gonna figure it all out in France, and then we're gonna laugh about it over a glass of wine, and that's, that's really what happened. But what, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, unfortunately, I haven't stopped laughing about things over a glass of wine. I guess it's a cup of wine tonight. But, <laughs> so I got to France, and we traveled to south of France and ended up in Toulon. Worked with the city of Toulon on a project, and what really touched me, and when I found my, I, that's where I found my calling for architecture, is that the place we were working at in Toulon was a place that was, I guess it was one of the bombing sites in World War II, and it looked like World War II happened yesterday. And I, here I am, I'm in France. It's supposed to be bougie, bougie, je parle français, nicey, nicey France. And I'm seeing some things that I had, I'm from Detroit. I haven't seen some things I had not seen ever, ever. And so I realized that architects are needed in America, in Europe, in uh, everywhere. So I gotta get, a, 
get it back together, get that self-sufficiency back within myself, and finish. Because someone somewhere needs me, so I have to get it together. Because someone somewhere needs me. So then, moving forward after that, I have to buy it over a glass of wine with my professor. She said, apply to the You Dream program. And I said, okay. Now mind you, this is my third year. You're supposed to do it in your fifth year. You Dream is an acronym for Urban Design Regional Employment Action for Minorities. And it's a program through Carnegie Mellon School of Architecture and the Remaking Cities Institute, of which my mentor who is in the house tonight, Dr. Erica Cochran, is the program director. She is the bomb. So she told me to apply to this program and I applied to it once I shared my desires, you know, to work in the community and do urban design and all that good stuff. Little, little did I know that the associate professor was Mr. Raymond Gendros, uh, one of the founders of Urban Design Associates here in Pittsburgh, um, Carnegie Mellon alum, board member for the program. I mean, like, was my plug into the program, really. I didn't know this. She just, they just looked at my passion, they just looked at my talent, they knew what I liked to do and said apply for this program. Little did I know I had an easy end. No way. I had no idea. But I got into that program, got here, met some really good people, but all throughout my career, my academic career, now my professional career, I've tried to just be a really genuine person. I have tried, I've tried, Lord knows I've tried. And it's been hard. And in, in a world where people are not genuine anymore, it's hard. And of course, it's double hard for me because my name is Christian, so I have to be a Christian. <laughs> and it doesn't help that my name is actually Christian James Hughes, so I, it's, I, it's, come on, you got to, come on. But I tried to be a really genuine person, but because I've been genuine to so many people in my life, in my hardest times, the people that I was genuine to, they were genuine back to me. And you know, my, my genuine kind-heartedness had been reciprocated. And my success here in Pittsburgh is attributed to, you know, all of the people along the way that I was kind to, that reciprocated that kindness to me. I was able to get here to Pittsburgh, um, work up under Dr. Erica Cochran. <laughs> One day I'll be Dr. Christian Hughes, like Dr. Erica Cochran. But I was able to work up under Dr. Erica Cochran, and you know, we developed a very genuine relationship and then transitioned to the internship portion of the Eugene Fellowship to Kingsley, where I worked under Fred Brown, who was the then associate director, now the um, president and CEO of HC's Homewoods Children's Village. Because of that genuine relationship, I met Jenna Kramer and Andrew Ellsworth, two of my favorite people, and I'm on the stage because of them. I mean, you know, but I say all of this to say and give you all of these stories and all of the laughs to say that, you know what? Two things. It's good to be good to people. It truly is. It is good to be good to people. And secondly, a lot of your setbacks are setups for your comebacks. And you must remember that the thing that is in the slingshot. Yes, it's in the slingshot, but the further it's drawn back, the further it's going to project itself for forward. So always remember that. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. So, I want us to just thank all of our speakers. Can everybody stand up and come up on stage? Everybody's going to come up on stage. <laughs> They're like, I'm not ready. <laughs> We're a little bit over time, but I'll take two questions from the audience for our speakers. Two questions. It doesn't have to be about their story. It can be about how hard it was to tell a story. Yeah? I want to know about dumpster diving to get food that can be thrown away. Well, it's added. Oh, oh, I'll repeat that. I want to hear about your dumpster diving to find the fruit that's thrown away. I think dumpster diving is a little romantic. Um, it's not quite dumpster diving. We actually save food from going to the dumpster. So we rescue it at the source. Um, and um, this time it's, it's the grocery stores. 
and there's a lot of it. Thank you. Yeah, Erica. get one word from each person. Ooh. We asked about a word for them, but I want them to each give one word. <laughs> Everybody's going to take a step back. Yeah. I'll say this. Community. <laughs> Let me just say, I just came from a retreat with Aurora where we did a lot of that. <laughs> um, Activism. Whispering. Read. <laughs> Family. Passion. Advocacy. Courage. Pioneers. <laughs> Charity. Thanks to all of our speakers. It takes a lot of bravery and courage to get up out here on stage and bear your soul and work through a story. It's not easy. Um, I also wanted to make sure all of you are aware of our next Inspire Speaker Series, March 10th. Joel Glansberg, who's famous in regenerative design, um, and Valerie Goodwin, who's all about the story of place and will actually be doing some work in the Hill District uh, as well. Um, so we don't have a local speaker for this, but I also want you to save the date for March 19th. No, not March 19th, May 19th, um, which is when we'll be bringing Paul Hawken to the Inspire Speaker Series stage. Um, so he, he's famous for ecology of commerce. Um, he's a bedrock of sustainability and especially sustainable business. Um, so I'm looking forward to that. I hope you guys are looking forward to that as well. Thank you for listening. Thank you for hearing our stories.